presenter is Professor Philippe Streck. Um, it's kind of interesting because um, Papa virus is not perhaps in, in swine medicine something that you think about as a re-emerging pathogen. Many practitioners probably don't have power virus top of mind. And I think uh, Professor Streck will maybe uh, make you realize that we need to rethink uh, our, our position around power virus. Uh, professor Streck is a professor in the Universidad de Caixas do Sul. I'm sure my pronunciation is, is terrible. <laughs> um, he um, it's just perfect. Okay, that's about all I can say. Obrigado. Um, it, um, it, his uh, background is that he's a veterinarian. Uh, he trained at the university. Uh, he also conducted a master's at the university and then a doctor's degree um, at the University of Leipzig in Germany. And I believe his German is, is probably better than mine, which is quite embarrassing. And um, uh, his uh, focus has been in, around molecular epidemiology, veterinary virology, and uh, really understanding, better understanding the viruses that affect not just swine, uh, but with, with a focus on understanding the epidemiology of viruses using molecular techniques. So with that, I uh, leave the floor to uh, Professor Streck. Uh, welcome and thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. I uh, would like to thank all the boring in your hand staff for this invitation. I uh, would like to thank also all the technical staff for the help. And I'm very honored to be here and to speak with you. And in the next 30 minutes, we will talk a little bit about this virus, porcine parvovirus. Uh, we will briefly discuss this, this some important topics of this virus like structure, genetic, and clinical science. Therefore, uh, thereafter, we will see how diverse are porcine parvovirus. Then we'll take a look at the molecular epidemiology of this virus. We will see some possible evolutionary drivers of PPV. We'll take a look in the wildborns. Uh, for PPV as well, and after that, we'll see some perspectives. Well, porcine parvovirus was first, firstly isolated in the 60s. Porcine parvovirus was found as a contaminant in, in cells that were used to propagate, to replicate classic swine fever. And thereafter, in the late 60s and in the 70s, PPV was obtained, obtained in several studies, always related with uh, severe reproductive losses and also, of course, economical losses in this fine industry. To talk about the importance of PPVs, it's, it's really quite easy. When I, I give a class of PPVs, it's quite easy to talk about PPV because PPV infect uh, domestic swines and wildborns, and the only well-established clinical signs of PPV are the reproductive disorders that we can abbreviate with the synonym SMEDIM. And for PPV, we have this inactivate vaccines in the 80s, in the late 70s, and in the 80s. Uh, we have several studies trying to, to establish a vaccine and around the 80s, the vaccine was established based on this NADL2, based on these non-pathogenic NADL2 strains. At the time, for many, parvovirus was considered to be a, a, a solved problem. Another aspect of PPV that we need to know is the some genetic elements of PPV. If you can take a look here in this in this genomic map of PPV, we can see a very small genome of about 5,000 nucleotides. In this genome, in the left part of this genome, we have these non-structural genes. They are responsible for the 
the replication of the virus. On the other side, on the, the right side of the virus, we have these uh, structural genes, or we call it also uh, viral proteins genes that are responsible for the capsid. And we need to take a better look at this capsid. As you see here, uh, at right, we have the, the virus capsid, this, this 3D structure, and this capsid is built by the viral protein. If you take a look in this capsid, you can see a triangle in there. This triangle represents the viral protein, this protein that we call it VP2. And if you repeat this protein 60 times, we have this beautiful mosaical capsid that is quite simple, but also quite resistant in the environment. So the, this triangle represents a lot for PPV and therefore is important to know the representation of this triangle, as you can see here in the left part of the presentation. If you see in the upper part, we have also a triangle, a, a 3D triangle showing the upper part of this, of this capsid. And if you see in the inner part of this figure, we have also a triangle very down there in the figure. We have also a triangle that represents the inner part of the capsid. And in the middle, we have this figure. Uh, there is a, a 3D representation of the figure. We call it uh, a cartoon technique. Uh, and this, in this cartoon technique, we can see uh, some, some interesting parts. For example, in the inner part, a little bit down, in this, in this representation, we have this green structure, this half a helix, and then we have this yellow structures, we have called beta sheets. Uh, these both, both structures are quite important for, to maintain the integrity of this, of this protein. And there we have these loops, these very large loops there in the capsid, and those loops are not so conservative because they need to interact with cells and antibodies. Now, uh, we know that for many, PPV was considered to be a solid problem, but in fact, it was not a, so a solved problem. And we started to observe some genetic va uh, variability. And the first study to, to observe this genetic variability was performed in, in Brazil by Professor Hitzenheim. And Professor Hitzenheim at the time found 80 di 18 different phenotypes that clustered in two main phylogenetic groups. With different phenotypes, I mean a, a, a distinct capsid profile of this virus. Thereafter, we have some studies from Professor Uvi Truyen. Uvi also, Truyen also uh, found several uh, distinct capsid profile cluster in other distinct um, phylogenetic groups. And thereafter, we have several uh, researchers that also found different profiles for PPV. So, at this time, we started to, to make some phylogenetic analysis of PPV to understand this evolutionary history of the virus, and we observed that the virus has a very great diversity, and we also observed that we have several clusters of PPV. We also observe that these clusters have a very strong geographic relation uh, at the time, and we also associated with that a molecular clock. And then we could observe that most of these clusters uh, were built or were formed in the last 20 or 30 years. Therefore, uh, PPV was passing through a, a very, very 
uh, strong uh, evolutionary process, a very aggressive evolutionary process. We have a lot of clusters of DDD, however, we have the dominance of certain strains, mainly the strains obtained in, in German, this, like the 27A, for example. We know that this capsid profile uh, are quite dominant in certain parts of the world, for example, Europe and America as well. And so, for you, we have our first pool question. Is it possible to observe a high mutational rate in a DNA virus like PPV? Because, just to understand the question, it is expected to have a very uh, high mutational rate in RNA virus, like a coronavirus, for example, but we don't expect that for a, a DNA virus. How can I be? Uh, and please answer yes or no. And the answer was yes, we can have this, this high mutational rate. The first study uh, to, to try that tried to solve that question came from, from the team from Edward Holmes, and we have another great researchers in there, like Truyan Parrish and, and Shackleton, and they observed that the, the Kenyan parvovirus originally, originally came from the uh, Felian panlecopenia virus, and the Kenyan parvovirus passed through a, a very uh, aggressive uh, mutational rate process during the 70s and the 80s, and the virus could adapt itself into a new host from the feeling to the canning. And during the, that time, the, the virus has an aggressive substitution rate quite similar to the RNA virus, what we expect in the RNA virus. Therefore, we know uh, for, for science parvovirus that we can have, yes, this aggressive uh, evolutionary change for, for the virus as well. Now, understand that PPV really mutate, that's normal, but we need to understand a little bit of these mutations. And to understand these mutations, we need to go to this very, very old school study from Peter Tyson. In that study, Peter um, perform a comparison between the non-virulent strain and adult 2 and the virulent strain Cressy and Peter observed that all of the differences were located only in the viral protein. Most specific, specifically they were located in these six red dots here in the figure and if you can see this six red dots, you can see that these red dots are located in the middle to the upper part of this uh, protein. However, when we take a look in the new samples, I mean in the new substitutions observed in the, in, in the, uh, capsid, in the new capsid profile, for example, 27A, we can see that these new substitutions are not elsewhere in this, in this viral protein, but are located in the surface. They are very, very, very located in these viral loops. Therefore, that, that leads us to, to think uh, about the importance of these, these substitutions. Perhaps they have some importance for viral adaptation, or even they have some importance uh, as a vaccine scape substitution. Then we go to our second poll question. Is it possible that those new substitutions of the virus could reduce the neutralizing capacity of the antibodies generating by using a commercial vaccine, this very, very old commercial vaccine based on the, the Cress strain, based on the Enadel 2 strain, sorry, that we are currently used. 
And the answer was yes. Let's see. The first, uh, this answer was started, to, this problem was started to be answered by, by Uwe Trullian in this study. Uh, in this study, Uwe um, performed some non commercial vaccine using the standard another two strains, uh, two strain and other strains. And we vaccinate the cells with this vaccine. Thereafter, these cells were inseminated, and after that, the cells were inoculated with porcine parvovirus, were infected with porcine parvovirus. The results for the cells were quite okay because we could observe that we really don't have sheeting of virus per feces or per saliva, and, and also most of the fetus were quite protected against PPV. However, when we take a look in the, in the antibodies, in these antibodies generated raised from the, the vaccine strains in the cells, we can observe that these antibodies don't neutralize so well the, the novel strains, mainly the 27A strains. So, unfortunately, those antibodies have a lower efficiency in, in, to neutralize these this novel strains. And at this time, the hypothesis of this vaccine escape, because of that, was quite strong. To understand a little bit more of this a hypothesis and to work a little bit more with this hypothesis, we start to make some, some works to understand possible evolutionary drivers of PPV. And therefore, we perform two main models. Uh, we perform a model where uh, an in silico model, in this in silico model, we uh, perform an analysis called Bayesian uh, approach uh, or population dynamic, population dynamic, or even skyline plot. And, and this approach, the idea is to understand the, the number of the estimated population uh, through the years. And we expected really to see that, uh, we expected really to see an increase in this population number through the years. However, as you can see here, um, we have a, a decrease in, the, in this population uh, number through the years. And what was quite interesting is that this decrease was related with the introduction of vaccination and, in our herds. And now I need to also remember that a decrease in the, this population can also mean dominance of certain strains. To understand that a little bit better, we performed a, a second uh, model, uh, an in vitro model. And the idea of this in vitro model was simply to infect the, the virus and cells and pass this virus always forward in cells. However, we pass this virus forward using a maxi the maximum concentration of antibody that uh, allow us to, to pass this virus forward, that allow us to pass an active virus forward. In other words, we pass this virus forward always in a very strong uh, antibody pressure. And at the end of this, this study, we really expected to see some very nice substitutions, some very nice uh, nucleotide mutations, amino acids mutations. Uh, however, for our surprise, in, in that model where we have this strong selective pressure, we really don't have uh, a lot of, of substitutions. We really don't have a lot of mutations. On the other side, in the control group, without any pressure, where the virus were quite happy only with cells, uh, we have then a lot of substitutions. We have then 
a, a lot of amino acids mutations in this model. And therefore, we started to think that maybe the, the vaccine was not the, so important uh, for, this, for this evolution of the virus. And perhaps we have another function that we need to understand of these new amino acids. And therefore, we also perform another study. And in this study, we use uh, the non-virulent another two strain and the virulent grass strain as, as a backbone. And in this backbone, we use the, the technique site-direct mutagenesis or reverse genetic technique to perform a series of mutations. The idea was to create one solid mutant in each of the amino acid substitutions that we observe in strains like the 27A. So we create a series of mutants, I call it a library of mutants uh, to observe the importance of each site. And we uh, test these mutants against, obviously, against antibodies. And importantly, we, in this time, we tested these mutants against antibodies raised with, using some commercial vaccines. And the result was quite nice because we could see in that model that antibodies uh, raised against the original 27A strain they have a very, very, very good neutralization uh, capacity. However, um, the antibodies generated against these vaccine strains really don't have a very strong neutralization activity. And going a little bit forward, we also tested this uh, these mutants and our system uh, in cell. The idea was to see if these uh, mutants possess some, some, some activity that help the cell, the, the, the virus to replicate, to better replicate in cells. And the result was quite interesting because we can observe in our model that yes, all of the mutants help a lot the, the original backbone uh, to, to replicate a lot uh, much better in comparison to the, to the original Cressy or original NADL2. And therefore, that leads us to think that perhaps uh, the dominance that we see uh, in, in this 27A strain, in this new capsid profile that came not from the, the vaccine, uh, like a vaccine escape, but perhaps they came from a better fitness in, in the cells. But also, we need to understand where came this, this genetic diversity also. And here we may talk a little bit about wildborns because uh, during that time, Professor Daniel Kadan in, from Romania started to perform some very nice studies uh, with wildborns. And Kadan always observed that this wildborn, this PPV from wildborn, they have a very great genetic diversity. It was quite difficult to clusterize these samples and also to observe sometimes some certain dominance in the samples. And when we perform a, a, a molecular clock in the samples, I mean, when we compare the evolutionary history of the samples from the European wildborns and, and, uh, and the domestic pigs here from Europe, for example, we can observe that the, the wildborns have a much, much more aggressive substitution rate, I mean, evolutionary rate in comparison to the normal, to the 
the conventional pigs, conventional swine industry. Therefore, uh, we hypothesize that perhaps wild borns, uh, non-vaccinated pigs, or even non-commercial herds may have a, a nice, a very, very big importance to the emergence of new amino acid substitutions. Else perspective from these studies and else perspectives for, for PPD, um, we need to remember the importance to make the surveillance and to obtain new PPV phenotypes or even new PPV capsid profiles because we know that PPV have a very strong geographic relation. We know PPV, uh, the, the, the uh, distinct capsid profile may have uh, uh, a reduction in the neutralization capability of the, the antibodies raised by, by the vaccines. And therefore, we need to use the most prevalent strains uh, as vaccine-based strains. And finally, I think we need to understand better the role of the cellular immunity for PPV because we know uh, very few about this. We are just focusing in, in the T helper 2 cell uh, in, in cellular immunity, and we have an open field to explore in this, in this topic. And now, at last, I would like to introduce you my parvovirus family. We have a, a very huge parvovirus family, and I'm glad to work with very special people like Claudio Canal, Colin Parrish, Peter Tyson, and Uvi Truyen. Uh, but also, we have these new members in South Brazil. Uh, we have here assisting this, this uh, seminar Jessica Maciel, Muriel, Becker, and Jeza Biondo. And we are working now with Kenyan parvovirus, mostly with evolution, and we, try, we are trying to understand some very, very uh, dramatic vaccine failures in, in, in Brazil that we have with Kenyan parvovirus. Uh, but we are so we are also working uh, with uh, porcine parvovirus. We are performing some some, some synthetic drugs and trying to understand the, the antiviral activities of those of those drugs against those those viruses. Thank you very much for your time.